Now, since my last video, I've come up with 12 different stories from a musical. Title, genre, paragraph. Which one has the most potential? I mean, how do I choose? If only there was some kind of checklist. Hi, I'm Scott. You're watching Inside Musicals, a channel for all things musical theatre. Now, the goal of this project, Write a Musical With Me, is to come up with a commercially viable musical that has the best chance of being staged and being seen. Because if no one sees it, no one knows what we're capable of and we're not adding to our reputation. So even if this show is not the ultimate expression of our big Broadway dream, it could be our calling card, a conversation starter for our next opportunity. Hopefully a paid one. But while we're establishing our career, working on spec, we can make informed choices to help get it across the line. And while the strength of any show always rests in the quality of the material, there are other factors to consider. So here's the checklist I'm using. Categories across the top, titles down the side, they either get a tick or they don't. Then I'll tally the titles in the column at the side. But even if you ignore these titles, just asking these questions will give you some insights into your show. So number one, clarity. We've generated our 12 story ideas, so the first thing I do is just make sure that each one is expressed clearly and succinctly. Is it clear how it starts? How it escalates? Does it feel like a must-see? Is there a clear agenda? A reason to tell it? A point to make? And remember, we're not locked into this. This is just a starting point. And as we develop the story, we might discover it's actually about something completely different, and that's perfectly okay. But the clearer it is now, the easier it is to compare the potential of these 12 stories. So if any of yours are uh, wishy-washy, refine the idea now. If you still can't find that, that spark, that, that singular concept, no tick. <laughs> the idea drops down on the list. Number two, connection. I mean, do you love the story? Objectively, it could be great and make perfect sense, but is it something you can believe in? Something you can tell with absolute conviction? Do you love these characters? So you're gonna be with them for a long time, so they'd better be worth your while. I mean, even if they're despicable, are they deliciously despicable? Do they have room to grow? Because if they're just meh, and the show's just meh, the audience will just be meh. Actually, that's not entirely true. If it's just meh, it may never find an audience. Number three, musicalization. Now, why must your story be a musical? Does it play to the strengths of musical theater? Or it'd be better as a film, play, TV series? In which case, write a film, play, or TV series. Now, one of the criticisms of musicals, particularly from people who don't like them, is that they're unrealistic, because people just burst into song. But there's also a saying that musicals aren't so much life as it is, but life as it feels. And that's part of the power of musical theatre. Think of I Want to Be a Producer from Mel Brooks, The Producers. This is a flight of fantasy. It's an external representation of the man's inner life. So one of the first things we need to accept is that musical theatre is a stylized art form. We don't have to fight it. So how does your story benefit from this heightened reality? Can you do something authentic on stage that might be considered too theatrical for film or TV? You know, musical theatre, comedy, fantasy, romance, are perfect subjects, because they're already kind of larger than life. Same with exotic locales or distant times. Think Cabaret, Brigadoon, Once on this Island, Sweeney Todd. But contemporary subjects and familiar locales can be a little trickier. You know, if you live in New York in 2022, you know how New York feels and sounds. So if I write a show set in New York in 2022, you can be acutely aware of anything that seems incongruous. But if it's at least one generation removed from our time, say 1950s Melbourne, Australia, you may have fewer preconceptions of what that's like, so we have more creative leeway. Not that contemporary subjects are impossible. I mean, Next to Normal finds those heightened moments to make sense of character singing. Look up a production or the soundtrack to see how they externalise the inner world of those characters. So is there an element of your story that gives the audience permission to accept a heightened reality? Now, number four, musical voice. And this one's kind of for composers. Is there something innate to your story that suggests a musical voice for your show? Hairspray and Little Shop of Horrors draw on American pop music of the 50s and 60s to convey the story. Uh, sometimes a little night music 
uses variations of waltz time to convey a sense of, of romance and elegance. Dear Evan Hansen uses contemporary pop rock to say something about the world and the values of those characters. So the question is, what music best expresses the spirit of your story and characters? You know, if your story is about, say, the farcical nature of contemporary politics, maybe vaudeville is your go-to style. In Kandrineb's cabaret, this is the sound of Berliner Kabarett of the 1930s. In their Chicago, it's jazz fused with vaudeville. In one of my musicals, Winter Song, set in the 1890s, I referenced the mid-20th century Rodgers and Hammerstein era lyricism, at times harkening back to Jerome Kern for the more operatic numbers. But the show needed to feel like a musical and not an operetta, so I'd draw on that golden era Broadway to evoke a sense of past to our modern ears. Do your characters suggest a musical approach? In The Sound of Music, Maria plays her guitar for Do Re Mi. She yodels in The Lonely Goat Herd. The nuns sing hymns, which is a natural part of their world. And the captain sings Edelweiss and then later dances the Landler with, with Maria. And these both capture the essence of Austrian folk song. So what is the world of your music? And is this a world you'd like to explore? Number five, rights. Now, if your show is based on an existing property, still under copyright, have you negotiated the rights? Do you have it in writing? And how much will it cost? Now, only you can decide whether it's worth going down that path, but be wary if the rights holder says, write the show first and then we'll decide, because two things could happen. If they don't like it, they'll withhold the rights and you've just spent years of your life on material that you can't use. Or if they love it, they might jack up the price because they can see a gold mine. So if the rights are necessary, work them out now. Now, number six, adaptation. Now, the great advantage of adaptation is a predetermined story, character, plot, themes. And then your job is simply translate it to the stage. Not that that's simple, of course. But there's also the benefit of a pre-existing fan base. Now, at its best, nostalgia and familiarity are a marketing dream. At its worst, it's just recycling, lazy, a cynical money grab. So the question is, can you improve upon the source material by making it a musical, or are you just doing it because you can? Now, Hairspray, Little Shop of Horrors, both improved upon the original B-grade films because they refined the story and they adapted to the strengths of musical theatre. But if your show isn't better as a musical, you risk alienating that existing fan base. And if it's just a pale imitation, it may not find its own audience. I'm thinking Footloose, Ghost, Sister Act, sorry to say, none of them surpassed the spark of the original film. But then consider the impact of adding music we all know music is a powerful emotional button, but does it help or hinder your property? Maybe you want to adapt Star Wars. The story is already grand, the music is already operatic in scale. Once you start adding songs to the scenes, bloating them, the story could just grind to a halt and it's no longer the Star Wars we know and love. I mean, you could make a fun, campy fan parody. I mean, why not write your own campy sci-fi if that's what you want? At least then it's original and you don't have to deal with rights. Because, <laughs> yeah, good luck talking to Disney. Number seven, star appeal. Now, we all know that having a well-known star in a lead role can be good for business. It lends credibility to the project and brings more eyes to the piece. But let's flip that on its head and ask, are our characters star worthy? Are they complex, memorable, well-defined? Or are they just bland, interchangeable echoes of each other? Would the story appeal to a major star? Is it something they could get their teeth into? I mean, we've all heard those reviews where a star was wasted in a role. And by that, I don't mean drunk. I mean, maybe they were, who knows? But I mean, where the character or the role was so undeveloped that even their talent and their charisma couldn't save it. So think of star worthiness as a benchmark we can use to evaluate the depth of our characters, the strength of the story. So even if we can't get that name star in the lead role, our characters are vibrant. They leap off the page and come alive for any actor and any audience. Number eight, commercial viability. Now, musicals are expensive to produce. There are a lot of moving parts. And gone are the days where every Broadway show has an ensemble of men and an ensemble of women in addition to the named cast. Your producers want to know that every dollar is justified because a Broadway-sized show is a behemoth. You're hiring anything over a 1,200-seat theatre, 30 to 40 in the cast, 10 to 20 musicians, backstage crew, 
front of house, design, sets, costumes, marketing. The larger the production, the more expensive it is at every step of the way, from the initial development through to the workshop to the final production. And these days, it's often the workshop that generates bars to get it on stage. But can you afford to workshop a cast of 40? And even if the workshop is brilliant, the chances of a first-time writer attracting that large-scale investment are pretty slim. Not impossible, but it's slim. So for the sake of this experiment, think of it as an off-Broadway show, more intimate, more compact. You don't have to compromise on the ideas, just scale down the execution. The sweet spot is maybe six to eight actors, because some of them can double, but vocally, it's a big sound without breaking the bank. A lot of producers might prefer three to four, because the more actors on stage, the more musicians you need to balance the sound. Or consider an a cappella musical, because then all of your performers are all on stage making the music, and you might be able to justify more of them. Or if you have an epic story in mind, ask yourself, could it be told from one person's perspective? Could it be a one-person show? But for this experiment, think a maximum of 10 to 12 in the cast, and then keep asking yourself, are they all necessary? Because there are successful small-scale productions, think falsettos, next to normal, with productions all around the world. Uh, soundtracks, sheet music, generating both attention and revenue for the creative team. So don't underestimate the value of a smaller-scale production. Number nine, audience. Now, a Broadway-sized show needs to fill a lot of seats, so it needs some kind of mass-market appeal. Whereas an off-Broadway show can be riskier, uh, more niche. Now, logically, you'd say that a niche brings in less of the market, which is true, but if you speak the language of that niche, you'll bring in a highly motivated, passionate audience. So does your subject matter lend itself to an off-Broadway treatment? Think of Menopause the Musical, a subset of the population, but a passionate audience defined by a common experience. So does your show speak their language in a way that they value? And how do they identify themselves in the characters and the story? Now, if you think your show has a more general appeal, does it at least have some je ne sais quoi, some high concept to appeal to that general audience? From their perspective, they're taking a risk on an unknown show by an unknown author, possibly with an unknown cast. So the concept has got to sell it for them. But if you can define a specific audience, those early adopters who are easily enticed to come, then they'll do some of the work for you and spread the word. And if you have a marketing plan to reach that audience, so much the better, because investors will love you. So before we get to our scorecard, let's think about the resources we might need for this show. Number 10, resources. Now, writing a show is a creative endeavor. Getting it to the stage is business. And if you can satisfy both of those things without compromising either, you're in a really good position. But if you have no source of funding, could you realize this show with the resources you already have? Because no matter how good it is, the show's no good if it's sitting in some drawer somewhere. Could you perform it yourself? Do you have friends who could help out with a, a reading or a sing-through, maybe a workshop? Do you have a computer, software, mics to record demos of the songs and do them justice? If there's no way you can afford to workshop this professionally, do you know a university theatre course who might want to produce it with their students? Now, we'll talk more about how to get it to the stage once we actually have a show, but it's worth having a plan for what's feasible with the resources we already have. So before we go any further, do you need to reconsider the scale of your project, or at least how it might be executed differently? Okay, to our checklist. We should start seeing some patterns now. Now, if you're really particular, you could rank each of your stories from one to 12 under each category and then tally a definitive score. But not all the categories are gonna be weighted equally for everyone. So I'm just giving each one a tick. It's either a yes or a no. I mean, for me, the strongest indicators are the depth of the story and how much I love it. The rest are useful, but they're really just tiebreakers for me. Uh, plus in my situation, I also have to consider YouTube community guidelines because this is where I'm gonna be sharing some of the material. And some of my ideas are a little off, off Broadway, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But looking at this now, I think it's clear which show I'm doing. And that is something I announced in another video. Oh no, I didn't. Oh yes, I did. I'm such a mean person. I'm a terrible human being. I ought to be thrashed soundly and sent to bed without any supper. That's kind of a clue which will make absolutely no sense at this point. You just have to keep watching. Hey, 
Why not subscribe? Win-win. Love you.